Okay, thanks. Well, hi everybody. This is um, this is I'm glad we're kind of a small crowd, um, and for for reasons that'll become apparent towards the second part of this um, presentation. And I have a bit that I'd like us to sort of look at together, but then I really do want to have this be more of a discussion and more of an opportunity for you to either ask me questions about integrating technology with your practice or ask me how I do it. Um, and what I did, I did sort of joke with Lisa before we started that this was going to be an entirely different um, presentation up until this morning. That when I looked at the attendance and I saw that Lisa and Patricia were here, I thought I can't do the same thing I did for them in the class. I need to do something better um, it be, some, because I, I didn't want it to be a repeat. And so then I actually started thinking a little bit about what might be useful. and. <clears throat> I'm going to I'm going to hopefully share something now that will will perhaps be interesting and, and useful to you that's a little different than what I, I normally do. So this is a perhaps a familiar person, a uh, familiar video game. If you pl ever played Nintendo, this is Super Mario and this is um, the basic template for my Prezi. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off and maybe we can turn the light off uh, one of them anyway. Will that work? So I'm sorry I will be shrouded in darkness for part of this, but um, what I want to do is talk a little bit today about what I call epic social work in terms of how technology actually has something to offer um, in terms of social work practice and including games, but it's going to largely talk about games, although we will discuss technology in general first. And what I wanted to do when I started today was talk with you a little bit about some of the biggest challenges I see. Um, and you can hopefully, can you see that? One of the biggest challenges I see uh, with social workers is that they're conf they tend to confuse the term technology with mechanistic. That when we talk about technology, they really kind of think of it in terms of gadgets rather than relationships or gadgets rather than something that's more meaningful. And that part of why I have become very sensitive to this is because in my other life when I teach at Boston College, I teach sort of two ends, two different bookends. I teach psychodynamic and Freudian theory on one end and then I teach social work and technology on the other. And people keep saying to me, that's so weird. Why are you teaching Freudian theory and psychodynamic theory and technology? It doesn't seem like those two go together at all. And to me, it makes perfect sense. Um, because for me, technology isn't always about apps and cognitive behavioral therapy and reinforcement, although that's an important part of how we can use technology. But to me, it's because technology is meaningful. It's inherently meaningful. And how and why we use it is often symbolic. And that it shapes who we are as people, and it shapes our personality. Um, in a, in, a, in a way that's meaningful, in a way that's cultural. So that um, if nothing else, I want hopefully you to take away for today that technology isn't about, ga isn't about gadgets. It's about relationships, and it's about symbolism. And it's about the human attempt to have meaningful relationships, which is not how I think people often view technology. So that's my intro. What I'm hoping we're going to do today is two things. One is I want to talk with you about a clinical case where I use technology as part of an adolescent's treatment. And then the second section, I want to talk about how a human service agency used technology to help create a family. So we're going to take a look at two different things here. Well, first is a clinical case vignette about technology and how it's used in terms of treating an adolescent. And the second is how a human service agency uses technology to help create a family. So first, I wanted to talk with you about Colin. Colin at age 12, when I first met him. Colin was referred to me for several reasons, including low grades, family conflict. He was verbally abusive to his mother and also physically aggressive, often posturing in a way that was intimidating and had begun playfully but not so playfully pushing her right before they referred um, him to see me. Um, Colin's parents were married and happily married, but father did work um, in New York part of the time, and so he was traveling uh, for half a week every other week. And doing, during that time, um, Colin uh, didn't ever acknowledge missing his father, but there were increased arguments at home, both when his father wasn't there with mom and when father would return, and suddenly the family dynamic would change again. 
Um, there was a lot of sibling verbal abuse and occasional physical abuse. Colin was the oldest of three and was having problems with both of his siblings. And then last but not least, Colin was experiencing sleep dysregulation and irritability, um, which was just aggravating how people were not getting along in the house, and which mom was uh, convinced was because he was playing video games all the time. And uh, part of the reason they found me was because Colin was playing a lot of video games, and I have this reputation as somebody that likes to talk about video games. <laughs> so Colin came to see me, and we did end up using technology over the course of the treatment in a number of different ways. And I wanted to tell you what some of those were um, as part of, before getting a little further into Colin's story. Um, over the course of the treatment, his parents used technology in the, way of, in the ways I mentioned there. They read my blog. I have a blog up about gaming, and I also have several videos up that talk with parents about things ranging from some um, DBT-related skills to um, th rethinking video games. So there was a whole bunch of stuff that the parents were actually watching and taking, taking in. And I didn't know this until about three or four months into the treatment when dad sort of alluded to the fact that he was following my blog, which I always mention to my classes when I teach about social work and technology because it's why you never write about your patients online, um, because they do follow your blogs. <laughs> Um, so, so Colin's father was reading my blog, and his mother and father were watching my videos and finding them very psychoeducationally useful. Um, and I could actually see that in the way he would report them getting along with them and how they would talk about technology even after um, I had stopped seeing them on a regular basis as part of the treatment. Um, there's a video game known as Minecraft, and that technology came up very early in the treatment. Colin was very excited to know that I showed an understanding of Minecraft, that I played it. Um, and he was able to talk elaborately with me about Minecraft, and it was crucial for forging our therapeutic alliance. Can and I ask a question? Absolutely. Is Minecraft um, a game that adolescents often use, they know about it, Colin knew about it, he was actively playing it? Yep. No, Minecraft is a very popular game that has been, um, and it's also really popular and interesting because it's a game that is not only popular with adolescents, but with latency age kids that are headed to adolescence. It's a game that actually can kind of grow with them a little bit, um, and there are di there's a whole bunch of different ways you can, you can play it. You can play it on the computer by yourself, or you can beam into a multiplayer world where you can play it with other people, and that's what Colin, Colin, Colin was doing. Um, Colin was also really excited about uh, doing something in Minecraft called griefing, which is when you go to some friend of yours who you have a rivalry and you destroy whatever they built. So that they'll, people will build elaborate castles or towers or architectural structures. In fact, two years ago, someone actually built a computer in Minecraft. So we're talking about a virtual reality that has a working computer in it because they actually designed the circuit board and built the circuit board and built the electricity running through the circuit board. Um, so the people can do amazing things, and then adolescents can also go in and destroy all these things that their friends have and have a lot of fun with that. So that was clearly something Colin was doing and was enjoying doing, and the fact that I knew what griefing was, he just thought that was great. Um, another form of technology that's been used throughout the treatment was internet to show me rewards he was earning. He would bring in or have me look on my smartphone or my iPad what the latest uh, reward was that he was working for at school. Or we would look at things and maybe pick something he might want to work on. And uh, more recently, he started using YouTube in sessions to show me new music. That it's been very interesting that there's, there's been a developmental shift as he's been getting a little bit older. He started uh, doing newer things with uh, technology, and that's been showing me videos. And um, so uh, I don't necessarily like his musical taste, <laughs> but we did bond over Coldplay recently, and he was really excited that I liked old Coldplay, which I'm sad to say is really only two or three years old Coldplay. <laughs> But I, but, but I guess, and then last but not least, I thought this one was fascinating. This came up the past few weeks. He's using, um, and I'm using technology uh, to negotiate time concerns. 
um, because I would start a session maybe a couple minutes late, and then I would say to Colin, well, we need to stop because we're at the end of time. And he'd say, no, we haven't had 45 minutes yet. And the funny thing about if any of you who have been a therapist know that you are often got one or two or three clocks, and basically you have a watch or they have a clock, and so it can be all this wonderful process about who's right or who's wrong. Smartphones are all wired to the same server clock. And so this was a really interesting way where he was able to point out to me, look, your phone and my phone both say we've got five more minutes, which was a very healthy way for him to express some attachment to me, but it was also a way for him to negotiate a conflict uh, in a way that was not something I saw at the beginning of, of treatment with him. So I'm pointing out all of these because I, not because I think these are necessarily groundbreaking forms of technology, but because I'm willing to bet that at least some of these have popped up in your treatments with people. And it never occurred to you necessarily that these were ways that technology was actually being integrated into your treatments over the course of it. That there's a range of things from psychoeducation for parents all the way to ne ne negotiating the therapeutic boundaries of time and technology is playing a hand in all of them. Yep. Sorry. No, please this keep asking them. <clears throat> I don't get how internet is used to show rewards he was earning. Well, like what was, can you say a little more I can. I didn't want to tell you the reward because I didn't want I didn't want Patricia to know what the reward was. But he had he, he did a lot. He liked doing paintball and he had a lot of aerosoft rifles and things like that yeah. that he'd be working on. And so he would take me to the website oh. and show me pictures and say, "This is the one that they say I can get oh. if I get if I do any more homework or if I get a better grade." Oh, and that was reward to parents for Right. Right. So what was interesting was I got a chance to know regularly what the rewards were. I got a chance to see them and maybe comment on them. And believe it or not, I did comment on the Arizona rifle. I was like, wow, your parents are really you know, letting you do that. I'm, I'm surprised. Um, and then I would actually talk with the parents occasionally for family therapy and say, you know, Colin disclosed to me that you're getting him a, a, a Arasoft rifle. and last time I talked to you guys really felt uncomfortable with that what's changed so there was both a way it was helping me kind of you know re-engage with the family and assess things but it was also an example of how I could see these things and I could see what he was what what goals he was working towards and there's this there's just more detail in it than when a parent comes in the, the, I don't know how much aerosoft rifles cost right so if a student comes in and says to me my parents say I can have an aerosoft rifle if I get five A's I you know I may imagine that's a, like a fifty dollar reward or something when I see on the internet that an aerosoft rifle costs three hundred dollars I'm suddenly thinking wow this is really diagnostic this is really interesting and that's a level of detail where um, my projection actually doesn't become the static in there because I have the internet. I, ha I can see what it is. I can see how much it is. So those are some examples of ways technology came into treatment. Now, family intervention. I wanted to talk a little bit about what I did with his family prior to some of the clinical stuff with Colin. And the family interventions that I did first and foremost was really destigmatizing technology use and parent education. Some of this happens, through, as I mentioned, through the course of their reading my blog, where I'm very, as Nancy mentioned, gamer affirmative. But some of it was my talking with mom and dad about their concerns and what I understand to be the research about connections between video games and violence, um, that they're correlative and, and argued at best. Um, and to be able to sort of tell them that it seemed that Colin was really holding on to playing video games because he felt that was something he was good at and that I really didn't want them to take, take away the one thing he felt that he was good at. So that was one piece of family intervention right from the beginning, which was educating them about technology use and educating them about digital literacy. Um, I'll talk more about that in a sec. But the second one, which I think, you know, it, it, on the surface seemed like such a such a a um, minor thing, but that I advocated with the family to increase their cable broadway their broadband 
that they had the lower tier of bandwidth and there was a lot of fighting happening at the house because everybody's internet was slower and mom was crabby, dad was crabby, the two younger kids were starting to use the computer more and initially I hadn't thought about this as anything other than throwing money at a problem. Like one of the things I believe in doing with patients and with clients is if a problem can be solved by throwing money at it, Let's, let's do that. Like if two people are living together and they're having a hard time around chores and they can afford someone to come and help, let's do that. That's often a simple solution. In this case, what I didn't realize until later was that I was actually supporting the family and acknowledging that they were as a family and the kids were going through a developmental change. That there was needing, they were needing more bandwidth because everybody was getting older. And as the kids were getting older and they were connecting more with the outside world, and connecting more with friends by playing video games or with computers or connecting online to go to school, the bandwidth couldn't tolerate it. And so if you think about it, actually talking with a family about increasing their bandwidth is a way of acknowledging and validating that they're growing as a family, that people are getting older and are maturing, and that the family system needs to accommodate a change that comes from that. So that was actually one of my, in retrospect, like it's one of those things that when you do it in the treatment, you think, well, it wasn't one of my best interventions. But now I think about it, I'm like, wow, that actually was a really great, you know, I'm very proud of that intervention like, because it was mirroring the changing family system. And they can throw money at it. And 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 you know, in fact, and in fact, dad dad was a little dad dad was a little controlling around money. And in fact, this was a way for him to work on it because he really he was really feeling it as much as anybody else. And so, it, it did help him actually loosen up a little bit uh, in terms of spending. And then the last piece of family intervention that I did was I normalized for. Colin's parents that um, there is such a thing as multiple digital literacies and that they needed to help him understand them and they, need, they needed him to build skills in those digital literacies while at the same, same time acknowledging that they didn't necessarily have those digital literacies in place. Um, and it would come up in many different ways. It would come up in saying, you know, Cal, you know Colin, you're, 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 interrupting, you're interrupting your dad in treatment oh, hold on one second, I've got my cell phone, I need to answer that. And to help the parents see that, oh, you're actually interrupting our session with that phone call. And to be able to help them see that, oh, we're not digitally literate in how to integrate using smartphones into a social setting, or, or in this case, a health appointment. Um, it was an educational moment in terms of digital literacy around economy when Colin started getting stuff for his iPod Touch, and suddenly there were credit card bills that were a little bit higher and that people were really worried about. And the parents needed to understand that whereas when they were growing up, they just would ask someone for 20 bucks or 10 bucks to go do something, that in the digital age, unless they change their passwords, things are linked to credit cards, and kids are learning how, are, are spending money before they're learning the value of it. So these were, this was, the third way I think most significantly I've, I've intervened with the family is help them understand, yeah, you don't know how to do this yet because you and I and all of us are part of this historic moment where we're having to learn how to use technologies we've never actually had before. When mom and dad were growing up, they didn't have a personal computer that they carried around in their pocket. Nowadays they do. It's called a smartphone, right? So those were family interventions. Now, in terms of Colin, the number one intervention that I've done with Colin has, to be, has been to play copious amounts of Call of Duty. For those of you who don't know, Call of Duty is what we call a first person shooter. And what you do is you have the perspective of the soldier who is trying to shoot other soldiers, either robot soldiers that are part of the game's artificial intelligence or other players. And over the course of the past two years, I have played far more Call of Duty than I have ever wanted to play. That I, although I love playing video games, I never was one that was a fan of first person shooters. It wasn't something I was interested in. And I'm happy to say that as a result of this treatment, I now understand better what I was missing. <clears throat> one of the things that I was missing that we, I noticed with Colin was that playing Call of Duty was a steam building 
that the idea of him being able to do something with far better sp visuospatial motor skills than me, to be able to unlock things that I couldn't unlock in terms of achievements, made him feel very proud of himself. That he would frequently come in and tell me how he'd leveled up the, li the, the latest gun, gun that he had so that it was now gold or diamond covered. And that he was constantly wanting to talk with me about his achievements in the game. The second thing that I thought was really interesting was that Colin, Colin came in not doing homework. And the reason he didn't do homework was because, as he said, you don't get graded on it. That his middle school had this, in my opinion, crazy attitude about homework, which is you're not going to get graded on it, but you have to do it. And unfortunately, if there's really no incentive to do it, that was clearly explained to him, he, he didn't get why he needed to do it. And so his parents would have no end of arguments with him about it because, and his line would always be, it doesn't count to my grade. I don't have to do it. It doesn't count to my grade. And so as we played Call of Duty, it, Colin figured out pretty quickly that I was really bad at it. And he um, was very clear with me that he thought I was bad at it and that I really should improve it. And so thinking quickly, I said, well, why don't I make a deal with you that I will play Call of Duty one half an hour a week between our appointments so that hopefully I'll get better at it. And I did do that, and my gameplay did improve a bit. And as he was remarking on how my gameplay was improving, I lowered the boom and said, that's why homework's important, Colin, not because you're graded for it, but because it's practice. Just like Call of Duty is practice. And by being able to help him reframe homework as practice rather than something that just didn't make sense to him in terms of grades, he actually started to improve in doing his homework because he started to find something meaningful in homework to connect to. So that was the second big thing Call of Duty helped us with. The third was what I call my sniper revelation. And this, my sniper revelation was something he kind of knew already, but I didn't know. OK, so when you play Call of Duty, you have to picture these game pads, these things that people are playing on. And there's a trigger on the right and a trigger on the left. The trigger on the right is the one that you fire. And the trigger on the left is the one that you will do what we call scope, which means you push that trigger and suddenly the, the gun gives you the focus so that you can scope in on whatever your target is. And I was doing terrible at this because I kept hitting the fire trigger and never did the scope trigger. And so I would be shooting, and nothing would be happening. And Colin would say, you have to hit the scope trigger first. And I tried doing it. And as I started practicing doing it, I realized that I was having to learn impulse control. That when I saw the target, I had to see the target and not pull the trigger, but pull the trigger that's scoped, and then fire. And what I realized was that this kiddo was teaching me what this video game had been teaching him, which was impulse control, which is entirely counterintuitive when you think of first-person shooters. You think of them as these violent, aggressive games that are basically people are just you know, running willy-nilly shooting people. But in fact, to do, to do well at the game, you have to train your brain to delay the impulse and to do something that's counterintuitive, which is to press a different trigger. So that was my sniper revelation. And as I kind of went through it and I talked with Colin about it, we started to be able to have a common language about what impulse, what impulse control means, how it can really seem weird, because I would keep wanting to pull this trigger. And I knew that I needed to not pull it and pull this one. And could he ever relate to how he knew he needed to do something different than what he was in the middle of doing? Well, yes. Well, welcome to adolescence. That's sort of what we talked about. The next thing happened at Call of Duty uh, with Call of Duty when I loosened up, and this wasn't him, this was when I loosened up, was we were able to use it to help him modulate verbal aggressiveness. That one of the things this kiddo got in trouble with was being verbally aggressive with his parents in terms of defiance, his younger siblings who were more vulnerable in terms of teasing in a, in a way that was really hurtful. And I think that as therapists, we often have a hard time with aggression. That in our profession, we, you know, the idea of aggression as something that's inherently bad is kind of bandied about, rather than seeing aggression as sort of an evolutionary skill that's allowed us as a, spe a species to, to survive and progress. And that aggression gets a bad name.
and that what needed to happen with Colin and I think with a lot of kids, is there needed to be a place where there could be some verbal aggression in the form of teasing back and forth. Oh, you got me? Well, I'm going to get you this time. All of this putting of those aggressive impulses from out of the play into a verbal kind of exchange that could be playful. And that when I started to lighten up and not be saying these sort of therapy things like, well, it sounds like you're really this, or oh, you appear to be really that, but actually was able to get in the play with him and be verbal and tease him, um, he actually warmed. And I noticed that he started to have a decrease in some of his arguments outside of the classroom, outside of the class, I mean, outside of the therapy room. Another thing that Call of Duty has been wonderful for has been interpretation. Um, about three months ago we were playing and he was having such a great time with the fact that I couldn't see him, uh, I, I couldn't see him uh, coming and he would kill me over and over and over again in the game. And every once in a while I would get a kill in and get him and he would say, good job, and I'd say thanks. And he'd say, of course, you know, it really took you 25 times. And after a few of these, I finally said, Colin, have you noticed that every time you give me a compliment, you need to take it back? Why do you need to take it back like that? And he said, because I don't want you to feel too powerful. At which point I said to him, and made probably one of my biggest interpretations in the treatment to date, which is, I wonder if that's because you feel powerless in most of your life. To which he responded, yes. I actually feel powerless in just about every part of my life. Now, to get a kid who's harassing his siblings, bullying his mother, verbally aggressive, to get to the point where he actually enjoys nurturing others, it took a first person shooter. It took him being able to say, let me teach you how to do that sniper thing. It took him having practice being able to say, good job, even though he needed to take it back. And that over the course of time, he started to experience how he enjoyed seeing me happy when he said something that was nurturing to me. That when he said, you did a really good job there, and I'd say, thanks, and, you know, and did the sort of marked extra emotional expression, he got to feel a, a, a sense of enjoyment. And this was a new form of relationship for him, where he was in control, where he had more knowledge and more competency, and someone else felt good because his opinion was worth something to them. <clears throat> and then the last piece about Call of Duty, which is very important, is that the way the game is set up is you can either collaborate with each other in certain forms of the game, or you can compete. And so the game became this wonderful arena for me to assess what kind of mood he was in, what he was looking for each day, because some days he and I were side by side, teaming up, taking down zombies, and other days he was going to kill me repeatedly and laugh about it. And he needed to do both of those in the course of this treatment. And what's happened is this particular game has allowed a holding environment for all of those things to happen. So two weeks ago, Colin came in and asked me if I could bring my laptop in so we could play Civilization V. Now, for those of you who know Civilization V, it's very different than Call of Duty. It's not a first-person shooter. It's a game that is turn-based. It's a game that is even more strategic than, than playing a first-person shooter. And it's a game that is easier for people to sit and talk and play together. And so that we've gone to our laptop where he's actually playing with me this turn-based game where we're both creating these civilizations and exploring this new world map. And I'm thinking this may be a developmental shift. I'm thinking he may be ready to do something else. And for those of you who have been sort of familiar with Freudian theory, don't you see what an interesting symbol this is, that we've gone from aggression to civilization, that we have begun to bring civilization to this noble young savage. <laughs> this is Colin at 14, after two years of treatment. He's excited to start high school this year and has actually been doing his homework. His sleep has improved, except when he's on vacation, and then he binges on doing all sorts of stuff that keeps him up at night. His verbal abuse towards mom has decreased, 
And his complaining about her has increased to me, which I think is developmentally appropriate for an adolescent. And there's no reports that she's given me of any posturing or bullying that he has done with her. An interesting change has been that he's been able to express some dissatisfaction with me about his father, whereas before he couldn't talk about his dad in any negative or annoying way. Now I'm able to say, is your father patronizing sometimes to you? And he's able to say, yes, and I don't like it, which I think is a really important piece of treatment going forward. There have been decreased sibling fights. There's been an improved mood. And he recently told me he thinks his brother, quote, needs a mic to talk to which I find fascinating because we haven't done a lot of talking. This has been very much a play therapy where talking was stuff that has started to kind of creep in. And one of the biggest, I think, linchpins of this becoming a more successful therapy was when I got over my bad need to talk about stuff or to reflect stuff or to label stuff or to interpret stuff. When I was able to sort of let myself go into the play with him and risk actually having fun or doing nonverbal things, that's when therapy, I think, really took off. So that is my vignette about Colin. And at this point, I'm going to ask that we stop recording for a few minutes, because I want to talk with you about how technology has been used to bring. So, so <coughs> Yeah. You know, all of these, you know, alarms were going on inside of yes. me. You know, like sniper and guns. I am. And, you know, all of that stuff. And right. I'm not surprised. Right. I mean, I'm just not surprised that I'm having that. I'm thinking, oh, maybe that was what I was hearing about this summer. You right. know. And, uh, and, 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 and so, so, so where I am right now is, ooh, I want a mic with every kid <laughs> who's, playing, who's playing those games, you know? I mean, but I know where that comes from. I mean, I know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just aware of, ooh, the, the assumptions and, and the concerns. I mean, you know, I went every, you know, I had visions of Adam Lanza, yeah. you know? Yeah. But I get what you were talking about. I mean, it looks like a brilliant way to do play therapy with adolescents. Right. You know, and, and I get the therapeutic potential. But, you know, just those other voices in my, my body were like screaming. Oh, sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, that, that's the challenge and the, the, the strength of a game. For a game to really work, it needs to resemble reality but be different from it. Mm -hmm. Okay? The two need to lean on each other. We need to have a symbol set that we know so that the game is familiar, but it also needs to be distinct from reality. Right. Okay, which is why we don't have Call of Duty peacocks where people are hitting each other with peacocks. That doesn't resemble reality enough for people to be engaged. Right. And I think what's important is to remember these are symbolic pixelated guns. Yeah. Okay, they're not actually any more guns than when people pick up sticks and are going bang, bang. And I think that I, I do. I'm glad to hear that you've got that idea. It's clearly one of the things I champion that 21st century play therapy needs to use 21st century play. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't use the you know the barrel hula hoop, the barrel hoop that we you know whack the stick like the beginning of Toby Tyler. Remember that? Did you ever watch Toby Tyler where he's doing the stick? Or maybe it's Pollyanna. But that's not what toys look like now. This mm -hmm. toys look like this, and mm -hmm. I think that those are, are are things that are our tools. Yep. One of the thoughts I have when you were talking about Colin, that, that sort of last bubble on Colin, yep. and you, he said, um, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm remembering it correctly, but he said he thinks his brother needs a mic to talk to. Yeah. I wonder if, you know, sort of our, our sort of impulses as therapists is to talk, right? Talk it out. I wonder if Colin <coughs> that you talked a lot during your session. Yes. Yes. Sort of, I could I could almost admit, you know see myself um, you know as a new therapist there was a time when I was very afraid of silence for yeah. instance yeah. so I wonder if you know maybe there was a difference in your perception and his perception of the the amount of talk in in your therapy sessions and maybe he felt like there was just enough 
you know, for him to for him to say something and for it to be helpful. And me, my, you know, you're up here like, oh my gosh, we don't talk about yeah. that. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. And one of the pluses to relaxing into play therapy is I don't have those moments of, oh, what am I going to talk about? Um, because it's really, that's, that's sort of my, on some level, feeling like I need to prove my, my worth. And that w a, a real developmental milestone for Colin was when he stopped coming in and we'd settled into this formulaic 10 minutes of him talking about things and my asking questions. And I know I'm not the only therapist that does this, that I think many play therapists and kid therapists do, okay, well, let's do the deal. We're gonna talk for a few minutes and then we'll play the game, as if the game is the reward and not the actual treatment. Right. When in fact, the, the, the word stuff, it doesn't, it's not often that useful for kids. And even if it is, it actually can happen while you're playing. And, I, I, and, and even then, I thought sometimes it took us out of the play, and so I was really, really careful. Like, if there was a big family event I kind of needed to get nosy social workery on, I would do something. But for the most part, um, I noticed conversations were a lot more fluid when we were actually talking about the play and talking about our relationship in the play. And one of the things that I, I do training for, for, the, the, for um, Harvard Medical School's uh, psychiatric social work interns and it is so hard to get our trainees to just shut up and play because we all feel like we've got the and, and I, you know what I really think the longer I do this we're all think we're not seeing the kid we're seeing this ghostly medical record superimposed over the kid we're like what are we gonna write what are we gonna document played Nintendo we can't do that they'll sue us or whatever and I think this is one of the problems with managed care is it's really given it's really made things all about observable behaviors rather than the robustness of a meaningful or symbolic play. And so that pressure, I think, exerts itself on trainees. And we all feel like we got to do something so we can write that we reflected this or that we discussed that. So your point is totally on, on, on I, I totally get it. And that I think that he probably would tell you I'm a chatterbox. And I would be like, oh my god. You know, it, it, can we can we talk a little more? But what was really funny was when I actually started talking less and playing more, we enjoyed each other's company more. And I think that's one of the things that maybe, you know, uh, we have a harder time accepting as therapists is that, you know, it it can make things go better if we enjoy each other's company. It doesn't always have to be about, well, I'm not your friend. I'm a therapist. It, you know, sometimes we can actually have fun, right, and still be therapeutic. But that's a great point. Well, at the same time, that engagement, the level of engagement is an equalizer, right? Yes. Because you're on the same, uh, I'll call it plateau platform, you know, the same game. Right. You're playing the same game, yeah. In fact, he's got one up on me because a half an hour a week of practice, mm -hmm. this kid plays this for months and months and months. Mm -hmm. And he was just schooling me. And so if you think about how he felt so less than, he wasn't doing as well in school as other people. He wasn't getting the same kind of attention his brothers were getting. His, he wasn't getting what he wanted from his father. He was left at home with his mom who, you know, confused him inadvertently because she would really put demands on him in the absence of his father to sort of be the man of the house or be a better model for his brothers. But then she'd also kind of talk down to him. And so he didn't feel very powerful in most of his life. And so to come in here and have this adult flubbing around and getting killed over and over again in this game, it felt really empowering for him, really empowering for him. So I, I'm trying to figure out what I want to say, and I'm not sure what it is, but I think maybe I've... We've got another half hour, so please. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> so when I took Mike's course in the spring, beginning of summer, I, I recall when I read the syllabus and he told us we were playing World of Warcraft. It was like, for the love of God, like this is the last thing we want to do. But there was a certain amount of trust that had to go into that, mm -hmm. where you just had to trust that we were headed somewhere for some reason with this. There was going to be good sense to it. Mm -hmm. And it was transformative. Mm -hmm. 
in a way that I don't know that I could have explained had I not gone through the experience. Right. The reason why I bring up the trust factor is I think as therapists and social workers, we attempt to engage somebody and sort of get them to trust us to a certain point right. where they can hear the message and we can hear them. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it was the opposite. It was, it was, in a way, we were sort of in the role of client, where we just had a trust that he was taking us somewhere, right. safe, to teach us something. Mm -hmm. it, was, um, it was just a really interesting experience. Mm. It was a very challenging experience. I don't know how many of you have ever taught educators, but they're very difficult students. Mm -hmm. Educators are very difficult students because they, they are, they're used to being the teacher, not the student. And what I thought was fascinating about the per this particular class was all of the arguments and the prove this about learning World of Warcraft as if it was somehow exempt from any other required reading. That because it wasn't print on a page, it was up for discussion that we could do it. Mm -hmm. And that if you think about, you know, you don't go into a class where we're reading Judy Herman's Trauma and Recovery and have someone say, you know, you're really going to need to prove to me that this is going to benefit me as a social worker. Right. How is Judy Herman's Trauma and Recovery? Read the book! It's a required reading. But we have this idea, because of technology and gaming, that they're not cultural artifacts or required reading, that it was fascinating. And it's not just these guys. It's, you know, my current, my current MSW students are now at the same, they're right before the point you guys were at when you started to feel efficacy in the game and you felt like you were getting competent. Why do we have to do this? This is so annoying. And what's fascinating to me and these are all social workers. What's fascinating to me is not only are they bucking it, bucking it and resisting it, but all of them are hearing each other complaining about how hard it is, and you'd think they'd say, hey, let's do a group. Let's help each other. <laughs> no, because we're in school. We're, we're, in, we're in school, we're in, we're in school, I call it kind of, we're, we're kind of like, I call it kind of tight butt school, where we have to do our own work, and we can't look at anybody else's work, and my achievement is whatever I do. Collaborate collaborate and, and, and it's so funny because if we as helping professionals can't remember to collaborate with each other if we can actually hear other students and say, saying I don't know how to do this and nobody offers to help it just reminds me of that case what was that case where the, there was a woman was being attacked and she was knocking on apartment doors it was a very historic oh, case yeah all these people heard that heard this person asking for help and nobody helped it, because it didn't occur to them, right? And so I think I see this with students over and over again. It doesn't occur to people to ask or offer help. And I think that's a real indictment in terms of our educational model. Something is really wrong when we've got educational models that have us so siloed into your own work, you know? Because when was the last time you went to a case conference at DCFS or DAC? I don't know what they call it here, but you're meeting around a kid or an adult, and they say, okay, the psychiatrist, can you please report on the meds? And the psychologist, can you please report on the testing? And then they ask, Dr. Ells, will you please report on the, the social history? And you go, I can't tell you. That would be cheating. Right. No, that's not how we do real life, right? So I, I think that what you were describing, it was, it was, it was a sense of, it was, it was, definitely a leap of faith you took, but I also saw you struggling with these imaginary bo bonds that weren't even constricting you. That you could have helped each other at any single time you wanted to, but nobody thought initially to do it. It's funny that you call it that way, because I recall it as collaborative. Well, I recall it as, hey, who wants to get together? It got that way, yeah. uh, but initially it wasn't. The other thing that I recall is um, Aside from your cat, like jumping in, <laughs> like a black and white cat coming in to the, to the you know camera uh, room, though is the um, discussions it um, promulgated in within your own families, and like one woman, a PhD candidate, I'm forgetting her name, her. I think her husband and son were real gamers. And she's, you know, okay, fine. But then she sort of like got it and it was like, you yeah. know, okay, now it's it's the family religion. Yeah. We all share we all share in it. It was it was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and then another stu another student who talked very uh, openly uh, with other classmates and me about her own trauma that she was working through, found this a actually powerful moment where she yeah. turned a corner in her treatment. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, it, it, you know, it's it, it's nice to actually teach these classes because then I get to see how it works. Yeah. Like because. I don't have to convince adolescents, right? right. Adolescents, but, but when, when working with you guys and seeing you actually, I got to level 12! You know, when two weeks ago you were like, it's just a game, what's the big deal? <laughs> and then to sort of say, wait, you're having a real feeling, a real experience, that's your real brain, and you've been, you've been transformed. <laughs> so. I, I, I recall, you know, um, that you had mentioned the, the relationships I, I recall it, and I remember very, very clearly the, the sort of the pacifism for you and the like. How else can I do this? Yeah. And I remember for me that sense of empathy for inanimate things. Like it, it's, it's so difficult to describe that <coughs> feeling. But I recall saying to Mike, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not getting, I'm not leveling up as quickly as I want. And he said, you got to start killing things. You have to start doing this and that. And I was like. <laughs> I was like, why, why would I do that? Like, these, these are innocent, like, it was a s real strange, by the end, you're like, I will kill anything to get through this chapter. Right. But, right. but it was interesting where I was feeling like, that's so unnecessary. Mm -hmm. right. Do I need to do that? Can I just go for, like, the, you know, the specific yeah. flowers that I'm looking for? It's, it's funny, isn't it? Because, and, and I do think to a degree there's a gender socialization mm. thing here oh, sure. and I think because our profession is predominantly a female profession we're always really pushing people in the direction of put stuff into words talk about your feelings mm -hmm. tighten up that aggression the feelings that get talked about won't get acted out that the reason we're talking about them is so that you don't get aggressive and to sort of hear the other struggle which is you needed to loosen up your ability to enjoy or experience yourself as aggressive. Get permission. Get permission. Yeah. It's a symbolic universe, right? You, no one is actually being killed. But the, 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 the injunction against it is so strong. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting to see how everybody has an area to grow in. And then just as a sort of a, 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 a what's the word, a postscript, Patricia didn't have to kill things because, as we later talked about, you, there are ways to level up, and including there are entire guilds in World of Warcraft that have leveled all the way up to level 90 without killing anything. They're pacifist guilds. They actually join up together with the goal of, we want to succeed in this game without killing, which, in fact, was one of the things you were endorsing as a point of view. There needs to be a way to succeed in life without right. killing, right? It's in the game. It's so Lisa, how come you did not for that? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to recall, you know, there, were, there were a couple of things that I blogged about <laughs> that really kind of brought me back to mm. like Younger. my dad. And yeah. Yeah. Like when you fell in the canal, right? Yeah. <laughs> Before you say that, Patricia, you wanted to, you wanted to add something there. Well, uh, well, I immediately came back to so issues of power. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And can one attain um, um, embodied power right. without needing to destroy? Right. Yeah. Right. To be or to move above, you know, yeah. power with rather than power over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And and there are ways. And exploring the countryside is one of the ways you can do it. Baking bread as a profession is another. But but then you had a very or falling in the canal. This is a. I thought this was really funny. <laughs> So, so what I recall about that is, first, the, the frustration. Something had happened with my computer, and I, <laughs> I'm sticking with that story. <laughs> Months later. Months yeah, later. exactly. So when I would use my keys to, to go forward, it would go the complete opposite. I would go back. Uh -huh. And so it was very um, disorienting. Mm -hmm. So I was walking on a bridge of some sort, and you know, Mike was playing with us, and and I fell into a canal somehow. Oh. And it it was, you were almost like omniscient in ways, like because we couldn't figure out how you knew where we were or what we were doing. And I remember you saying, "Did you fall into the canal?" Like, and I couldn't figure <laughs> out how you. 
saw that. And then, like, I was doing the backstroke, <coughs> and, you know, it, so it, it was really kind of funny at that time. But I recall very distinctly that, you know, Mike was had leveled up to, like, the highest level. Yeah. And he had so many powers. And he could fly in, and he could rescue, and this and that. And it was, um, and then he could put your, your avatar and follow. Mm. And there was such a comfort and safety to that. He kind of fished me out of the canal. Yeah. Uh-huh. And yeah. then he said, just follow me, and I'm going to, we're going to catch right. up with our other, um, you know, yeah. classmates. And there was something very, uh, I don't even know what the word is, vulnerable, mm-hmm. I guess, and comforting mm-hmm. about seeing yeah. him fly in mm-hmm. and fishing out of the canal and say, just follow me. I'm going to take care of you now. Yeah. And, it, and I think it really harkened back to mm-hmm. losing my dad at a young age. Oh. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Was there more to that that you were talking about? Well, I'm just, I think that kind of goes back to where I started with this, which is it, sometimes I get a little crazy with people thinking that technology is only for the certain forms of evidence-based treatments. Right. You know, psychodynamic treatment is an evidence-based treatment, and self-psychology, where we talk about self-object functions and idealizing self-objects, where you merge with that all-powerful other, that's what you're describing. And that those are are, are, are meaningful, again, meaningful experiences. You, I remember you posted about your dad, and it, 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 it stirred up real feelings, and it had a real impact. And the, the thing about, the hard thing about selling this bridge in terms of technology is until people actually get into it and try it, they don't necessarily know what they don't know. Yeah. And I can remember people saying, we didn't know there was going to be so much work, or we didn't know we'd have to play the game. And fortunately, a bunch of you stuck with it. But there's no, you know, you can't make people realize that there's an entire world of symbolic systems and therapeutic maneuvers if they don't try playing this game. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm. So in some recent discussion, <coughs> oh, I know, it was on um, online learning and Denise, um, Denise oh, presenting Denise on online yeah. learning said teaching her MSW students um, games like Spent huh. and um, it's, it's spent, correct? S P E N T. Right. I'm going to have so to write that one down. I don't know that one. It's serious games. And with with and it's it's interactive. You um you oh, the dollars to the end of the month. Gotcha. Uh, your two year old sick. If you take her to the doctor, the taxi's going to cost twenty dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or wait a night and hope she gets better. So those are the yeah. choices. And then you choose one, and then it's like okay, you know. Right. Well, we actually. Now sti- you get thirty dollars from the coffin. I mean, you know, worst right. case scenarios can mm-hmm. come out. Yeah. Well, there's a bunch of serious games that Darfur is dying, for example, yeah. which mm-hmm. provides some really interesting discussions. Not only because of the content where you actually have to make some of these choices and experience a virtual reality of poverty or a virtual reality of a, a living in a different society. But they also raise some interesting, I think, and important questions about is that, is that educational or is that cultural tourism? And I don't think their answer is simple. I don't think the answer is that it's just cultural tourism. I think it may be the closest some students get to understanding what it's like to live in uh, a politically war-torn area just if for nothing else because they're having to make some choices or think through some things. Is it the same thing as actually living in Darfur? Absolutely not. But again, remember, for a game to be effective, it needs to resemble reality but be clearly distinct from it, or it's not a game. I I think that in that particular example, I recall thinking like, should we be representing Darfur in cartoons? Mm -hmm. Like it felt like it was minimizing it somehow. It just felt like, oh, like, are we, are we, is this right? Is this okay to do? Yeah. Well, and you think about part of it is you're not necessarily the ideal audience. That the ideal audience for Darfur is dying would be elementary to middle school aged kids mm-hmm. or something, a product that could be used with kids that young. Because you don't want kids to have secondary trauma right. watching, you know, stuff about genocide or something. But yet, 
we also need to know things, right? So it's a tough one. And I think what's important is now you've seen Darfur is dying. Now you've tried these other games so that you can have discussions about it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's another one called Papa Wiyo, um, which is available on the PlayStation, which is a kid whose father is terribly physically abusive to him. And he has an imaginary friend or imaginary that sometimes turns into a monster that helps him progress through the game world. And it's really about trauma and dissociation. And in the full range of how we understand trauma and dissociation, which is that it can be adaptive and in certain times really important, and that it can also be really limiting. Okay. So I think notice how I'm, I'm really trying to stay with our mission of in infusing trauma theory, trauma focused work, and all the stuff we talk about. I think it's I think it's really easy to do with technology. So what is that last one? Papo e yo, Papo P A P O E, and then yo. It's like Papo and I. Had alternatives in what way? Yeah. Never mind. I'm, I'm because I've seen this. I think right. I probably hear. Uh, I think I sent you course, yeah. a, a post a, a post about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many different games, and they really are coming out with more and more. And what's interesting is there are now game developers in developing countries that are starting to create games that are more indicative of their experience. As with women entering more and more into, or being women claiming the space in game creation yep. and, and so forth. And so, um, um, because you offered a specific case study, and because um, I want to, I want to ask you, can you give me an example where you had a 12-year-old girl and have used games, and has it been any different? I mean, maybe, because I feel like I superimpose, right. you know, and, and I think the first class, with, the first time we went into World of Warcraft, my, okay. uh, my comment was, <laughs> I guess to live here, you've got to have 48 double Ds or something like that, just outrageously disproportionate, you know, <laughs> classically, over sexed females, you know. Oh, um, in the game. Yeah, game. yeah. I mean, the image is, and what's interesting is there are two theories about that, yeah. one, and, and both of them are sometimes applicable. One theory is so that the guys can have some, someone attractive to look at. The other is that there are a large number of people that are experimenting with gender identity and changing gender identity, and, and that's a way of doing it. But, but yes, but I loved our class, and Patricia is the grumpiest pacifist I've ever met. <laughs> she was, if there, if there was any, if there was anything that we would look at that peace could be seen a different way, pe pe peace, love, and in your face. But it was great because it was, it was really pushing us to look at something rather than just take it for granted. Right. To answer your question, the, um, ten the tendencies, girls tend to play on the whole, more social games mm -hmm. rather than competitive games. Mm -hmm. And the, what I have seen has been actually similar to the conversation we just had with Lisa, which is trying to get them more in the other direction, which is what are healthy ways of being aggressive? What are healthy ways of moving towards someone and saying, I don't like what you're doing, or it's my turn, or something like that? So that with 12-year-old girls, often what you'll see is, is, moving, is moving towards aggression a little bit more in a different way. Um, and the games you see are not, uh, I have not seen Call of Duty. I've seen much more social games. They're much more often embedded in Facebook or social networks. So. So the symbolism, the, I mean, you'll still, you know, obviously use interpretation and, and so forth in, in, um, in the process, but for example, how is powerlessness experienced in Candy Crush or, or well, and you know, I guess you could hypothesize that part of why people choose 
power choose Candy Crush is because it upset, absents themselves from the powerlessness they s experience in their daily life. What we could do is we could look at Colin and say the fact that he's able to language this piece about powerlessness, powerlessness speaks to a degree to his male privilege because that's not right. Something's not right for an adolescent male about being powerless. Whereas for an adolescent female, often the socialization's already happened. And what you would maybe see is, I'm going to play Candy Crush so I don't have to think about that. Mm -hmm. Or, and this is my bias, I'm going to play Candy Crush on Facebook so I can practice my, my dark Jedi social powers. You know how middle school girls just get each other going with the language stuff? It many times, and we're going to talk a little bit about this when we talk about um, I I verbal internet aggression um, tomorrow, girls can be a lot nastier than boys because they're more skillful, right? They have better verbal skills. They've had many more years of having to titrate their anger through words because they would not be allowed other avenues of expression. So I think that's, that's how I'm conjecturing you'd see it play out differently. Um, but I would say it would be a mistake to not ask how many, what, what, games, what games a young girl plays because as opposed to 97% of all boys playing video games, 94% of all girls report playing video games within a day or two when Pew Research did some research on it. So they're just playing, the, the, and um, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna go into it now, but when you play things like Minecraft, um, there are there are more there are more games that, um, in a way, I would have loved to have your class play Minecraft because I think you would have had a very different response because everybody has this sort of 16-bit blocky look. There aren't any buxom anybody's or curvaceous anything, so that just gets all sort of taken out and sort of if you think about it in terms of the psychosexual stages it's a very latency age game there aren't genitals or secondary sex characteristics everyone's kind of blocky and it's sort of like that's what being like like nine nines like right you don't think of curves you think of kind of it, it, it looks younger so go ahead Beth, did you when you when you there for the class of second grade? no uh, yeah. and, and believe me, <coughs> going to a sex club was one that I did sort of know on my calendar, but no, I missed that. Oh. Yeah, Lisa made a friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Accidentally made Accidentally. a friend. <laughs> so what, what was your point? It was, it, was a, it was a horrifying experience. Okay. A again, it was... Um, well, I was asking because um, that was uh, interestingly the characters the avatars looked more rudimentary but it was so much more highly sexed and mm -hmm. charged mm -hmm. yeah. which is kind yeah. of an interesting combination well and i think it's really interesting also um there's something in here about technology and sex and puritanism um and and part of it is uh, not in just not in your comment but that this was an eth I was looking at this from the standpoint of this is an ethnographic inter interview. This is an ethnographic field trip. We're actually going into a culture and we're going to look. And I remember telling you, if we're on voice chat, try not to say things like, oh my God, that guy's got a bull head. What's up with that? You know, just sort of you're doing an ethnographic s observation. Um, we have, I, I, I do want to talk about the freak twerking accident. Um, you guys know about twerking? And, oh, yeah. and okay, and so have you seen the uh, the twerking accident where the girl was doing twerking and she fell over and broke a table and caught on fire? Oh, it was a whole. It was and it was a hoax. Like but a right, but what I thought was fascinating about that whole thing was for a week it wasn't a hoax and people were sharing that and everyone loved it. And what they loved, and this is my theory, you don't have to agree with it. What they loved was here's someone reveling in their body and sexuality and look at them get humiliated. Right. Um, we are in a very puritanical culture. Right. We cannot. Well, it was a girl. It was a girl. Yeah. It was yeah. a girl. Yeah. But anybody that tries to engage in something that's sexual and bodily in public that's enjoying their body, because at the beginning of that, she's enjoying, and she turns out to be a stunt person. She's really very good at, at, at what she was doing. We want to see them get humiliated. But I don't know if that would be the same if it was a man. Right. If it was a man. We want to see girls get humiliated. Right. We Right. But go ahead, Brad. So I, I only saw that video like once or twice. Um, but 
wasn't sort of the premise is that she was alone in a, I don't know if it was her bedroom, but yeah. she was, she was in maybe an apartment and she was, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but twerking against the door and right. so opened it. Right. So, I mean, to me, when I, you know, I thought very similar kinds of things, um, one of the books that's kind of influenced me is The Puritan Way of Death. Yeah. Um, it's from another point in my life, but um, it was almost like because she's alone, she's, you know, she's experimenting with this sexuality, mm -hmm. but the lesson is you can't even experiment right. because this is the consequence. Right. So, right. I mean, there's almost like right. this voyeuristic quality of it, right? Like and you're never alone. We're all on the town common where all of the houses are right up front and anyone can look in the windows. And I would just suggest to you as, you know, the loyal, the loyal sort of opposition or male in the room, I think that there is awful humiliation of a woman going on here. I think that it's a different form of problem that men aren't even visible being sexual or gyrating. Yeah. Okay, so not that I'm saying that we should aspire right. to that, but what I'm saying is that we are in a very puritanical society where both genders get annihilated in a different way. Well, and men, yes, because the assumption is men are always sexual, men, men are always on, and men always handle that negotiation Right. Initially, yeah, all those right. expectations, that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. What, what, I, what I think is interesting about what you just said is that we recall watching that video, and though it appeared to be a private experimentation, it was being recorded. Being recorded. Right. So in my head, I'm thinking, right. she... She wants this She's inviting us to, to sort of enjoy yeah. it. But think of that projection, right? None of us, none of us said, huh, this must be rigged. You thought that. Tell, tell us what you thought, Steve. It just seemed too fake. You see all these people posting stuff online just to get attention. Mm -hmm. And with all the stuff that was going on with Miley Cyrus and all that other stuff, it just seemed too good to be something that was authentic. Mm -hmm. right. Because who does that sort of thing? You know, How realistic is someone going to do that? Oh, and someone happens to walk in and right. happens to right. the candle is there. Well, the candle and was happens. the giveaway. <laughs> but but think, about, like, think about what you said, because I think it's fascinating, because what you basically said was, it was too good to be true. Yeah. And I think that reveals our, something about ourselves. We want to see people get humiliated when they're doing something bodily or sexual it's 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 in our dna in this country that that that, that you know that the idea that this is sort of too good to be true it, it, i think it's very it, it, this always i think these youtubes always point their finger back and reveal yeah. us yeah. okay it, it one person posts this then five million people make it go viral right. who's really being talked about there what is the real social indictment? You know, I mean, if, if whether it's real or not, the fact that we all retweeted, and I just, you know, I, I, I kind of go back to sort of that these are symbol sets that we recognize. Like I watched it, and I knew, I had no context other than watching this video, and I just couldn't stop laughing. It was visceral. I looked in, and I just was laughing, and I just I watched it again, and I was laughing again, and I didn't know it was a rigged thing. And here I am, a social worker who's like committed 20 years of his life to working with, you know, disempowered men and women and working with domestic violence, and I'm laughing at this. It's in our DNA. And I really think it's got something to do with our very conflicted attitude towards sex and gender. Did, did your thoughts or feelings change once you knew it was right? In what way? For me, I was kind of like, I felt like I'd been had somehow. Well, it's because you had been. Yeah. Because you, you, you now were being confronted with the fact that you have sadism in you. Mm -hmm. um, that's what that's all about. That's the big reveal in that, right? That we all kind of want to see somebody, you know, humiliated. Interesting, because I took it, 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 it was chronological, the Miley Cyrus thingy, uh, the Miley Cyrus over, so-called over-sexualized Working. And then this comes up, and I took it as, I'm sorry, I lost it, but something about, um, this is what should have happened to Miley Cyrus. That yeah. was it. Yeah. That was it. And, and you know, that's, part of this is, 
the nature of technology is that it speeds things up. This, and, and because these two things happened too close together and too sped up, we didn't have the chance to understand that the second was a cultural critique of the first, right? It wasn't a very effective cultural critique of the first because technology's gotten too fast for satire in a lot of ways now. Right. Well, right. Well, and then the older women and the the ageism thing. I mean, I don't know if you've seen this, but older women twerking, and and, uh, but but anyway, I mean, uh, we're, we ended up talking about twerking today. Um, <laughs> but I think what we're talking about when we talk about culture and we talk about memes and we talk about all these things, those are all floating around in the lived space and anthropological experience of your patients when they come into the room, um, and so. When we talk about meeting the patient where they're at, we need to know about twerking, right? Whether we like it or not, that's where the patient is at. They're in the middle of this soup. And if we don't teach them, and this is where people don't always agree with me, but my, my bandwagon is, I think we have an ethical responsibility to in educate our patients about digital literacy. Because if we don't, nobody will. And if we don't educate the teenage girl about posting something on Facebook and that you can't take it back, or the, the, the boy about posting something on Twitter and 15 minutes later it's there for a while, and 15 days later it's there for good, it, we need to do that, right? And we've, I think we've had a history of stepping up to the plate as, as a profession and going into places like, you know, other people don't go visit people's houses and check out where they're living. We've done that. That's you know, we're, we're, we got to do the same thing when it comes to technology and digital literacy. We need to kind of you know have people bring their laptops in, which is why you know I go crazy when I hear therapists say you have to shut your cell phone off. You can't have it in the office, because my stance with patients is, of course you can keep your cell phone on. If it rings and you choose to answer it, you have a couple choices. If you want to tell me who you're talking to and have me part of the conversation, you can answer it in here. If you'd like to have privacy, you can leave the therapy room and come back when you're done the conversation. But you notice how I'm not saying shut it off. I'm saying let's be mindful and digitally literate about the choice you're making here. It's different. And I think oftentimes clinicians have this very knee-jerk reaction of just turn it off. And, um, and I think you see it in our profession. This is the end of my soapbox, but we, our profession is constantly talking about technology and ethics in the same breath. Yeah. You'll notice that was the first time I mentioned ethics today. Okay? There's a lot more to technology than worrying about ethics. More people sleep with their patients than do things on Twitter that are ethically problematic. Okay? In the citations in Massachusetts in 2011, there were... Um, 36, I think, citations that were given to social workers from the Division of Licensure. None of them were related to technology, and two of them had technology mentioned in them. Okay, and yet every single workshop about the internet or technology talks about ethics. And I know Nancy goes on about this, so I'm not going to go on more. So I want to be respectful of our time. I'm going to hang out for a bit, so you know, feel free to stay if you want. But thank you very much for your time and. Thank you. Thanks.